Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's lecture. Uh, I just have one quick announcement before we begin, and that's just a reminder that we will be having an exam next week. Exam 3 will take place on 5-1. Uh, again, I will have that open through the weekend, so that we, although it says 5-1, it should say 5-1 through 5-3. Uh, that'll be open from Friday through Sunday, just like before. And I hope you can start studying ahead of time. It will be on chapters 7 through 9. Uh, I will get a study guide up uh, this weekend, uh, so you'll have that to study from next week. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions regarding that, uh, please let me know. Uh, for the time being, I can say that it will be a nearly identical format to the previous exam that we just had um, Again, I was very pleased with your performance on that one. Hopefully we can continue this good trend. All right, so let's go ahead and start with today's material. Uh, here's a writing prompt for you all to give you some practice here. Uh, based off comparing Venus, Earth, and Mars. So we looked at these three planets over the past few weeks and chapters. Uh, what three factors seem necessary for habitability? Please go ahead and push pause, uh, write this out on your own, and when you're finished, continue. All right, the first factor is what we were calling, we will be calling the stellar factor. Um, and this is relating to the star, really the brightness of the star determines where the habitability zone is. So it depends on, it will determine how um, far out it is, it will determine how thick it is, uh, that is how wide it is, and if your planet is located in that region, um, that's sort of the first criteria we have to meet in order to have a habitable world. The second one here um, is called the, in the book, I believe, the planetary factor. We're going to call it the planetary size factor. That is to say that your planet has to be big enough. A planet must be large enough to retain internal heat. Now, the reason we need that heat is a couple of reasons, but directly, we need to have um, plate tectonics. Uh, heat for plate tectonics. And remember, this helps us regulate the climate. Without this, we could have a runaway snowball, planet, we could have a runaway greenhouse planet, we've talked about those effects, and it's really this plate tectonics, a way of sequestering and releasing carbon dioxide, um, sequestering it in the rocks and releasing it into the atmosphere um, to help regulate that climate. The third factor here is we're calling the atmosphere factor. Now this is actually related. And the reason is, uh, we'll talk, see in just a second, but we'll say that a planet needs an atmosphere to retain liquid water. Uh, maybe we should say more precisely liquid surface water. Um, and this is because we need atmospheric pressure in order for that water to not just boil away. If there's no pressure, uh, the water, even though it may be the right temperature, cannot exist as a liquid. And we've talked about this a little bit before, if you remember talking about um, going backpacking or hiking up in the high mountains. Uh, water boils at a lower temperature there because there's not enough pressure or there's less pressure pushing down on the surface of the water. And if that pressure gets sufficiently low enough, the water will boil at um, any temperature, really. 
like in outer space. Now, this, um, we think, requires a global magnetic field to protect the atmosphere. And this is where the size comes in. This again, this global magnetic field, this um, is related to the size factor. If the planet is large enough to retain that heat, then it can have the um, dynamo in the center that generates the field. We think that if the planet cools off too much, the core solidifies and the global magnetic field uh, ceases to happen. So it's the sized factor indirectly um, affects the atmosphere factor. All right, so let's look at a diagram of these things. Um, I'm a very visual oriented person, and so these types of diagrams help me. So we're thinking the brighter the star, the bigger and wider the habitable zone and vice versa. That is to say, the, the size and the brightness of the star affects the habitable zone. Where is it? And if your planet is in this region, you can have liquid water at the surface. Uh, this diagram here, the next one, is showing some plate tectonics. And we need sufficient heat if the planet is large enough. It will have enough heat to drive plate tectonics. And this convection cycle you see up here requires a lot of heat. That's a way of transporting heat from the core to the surface. And um, up here with the outgassing and the mid-Atlantic ridge and the subduction zones, um, it's the plate tectonics is key to regulating the the climate, it's the key to the two CO2 cycle and climate regulation. Keeps it from getting too hot or too cold. And if we have enough atmosphere, we can have liquid water at the surface And that requires atmospheric pressure. And But in order to maintain that, we need a global magnetic field to protect the atmosphere from the solar wind, okay? So I know I repeated myself from the last slide, but I think it's really nice to see this visually and how it all kind of links together. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the habitable zone. Um, here we're looking at the habitable zone today. This is the modern habitable zone. And the first thing you might notice is that there's two different colors here. We have both a conservative estimate and an optimistic estimate. It turns out there's no precise boundaries. It depends on your assumptions. Um, one assumption that 
we might consider is large impacts, like at Mars. We could have a large impact at Mars that would temporarily heat Mars, dump some water and maybe CO2 in its atmosphere, and it would temporarily be habitable um, even though in the long term it may not be. So things can change. We can have different assumptions about um, the strength of the greenhouse effect, things like that. So this inner habitable zone is from the inner region is from about 0 0.84 to 0 0.95 AU, it turns out Venus is just inside of the habitable zone in the region where it's too hot. The outer part here, the outer range, goes from about 1.52 to 1.7 AU. So it turns out Mars is within our optimistic estimate of the habitable zone. Now, one thing we can talk about here um, with Earth and part of why the year it, there is a conservative and optimistic um, region here is something called the moist greenhouse effect. And this relates to uh, water high in the atmosphere can add additional heat to the planet. And that would extend the habitable zone to 0 0.95 AU. So um, that brings this inner boundary that we talked about earlier out farther. And when we're looking at Mars, uh, the outer part Mars is inside the habitable zone, um, but too small to have sufficient heat, so it has no atmosphere. So, yeah, that's sort of what the habitable zone looks like today. Uh, only Earth and maybe Mars are within this habitable zone. Now, the habitable zone isn't constant. Uh, like it says here, this is the modern habitable zone. But the, star, the sun hasn't always had the same brightness. Um, so let's take a look at that. Here is a picture of the life cycle of the sun starting down here with the solar nebula. That's the nebular formation theory. That's where the sun formed. And um, then it lived for its lifetime. And this whole region here, we call this the main sequence. That's when the star is really alive. This is for all stars. And this is where they have um, nuclear fusion in the core. So we're thinking of hydrogen, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, turning into heavier elements. Now this is important because as we quote-unquote burn those elements in the core, they provide support and pressure to keep the star from gravitationally collapsing. Okay, um, you can see right here is now, four and a half billion years after its birth. And um, what's a little hard to see on this diagram, but the star is getting brighter and brighter. The sun is getting brighter as we move along. Uh, I kind of covered it up here, but there's something that says gradual warming. So as the sun burns nuclear fuel, uh, the, the core shrinks slightly. Core shrinks as sun burns fuel. I'm going to put burns in quotes because it's not really a burning. It's a fusion process. 
and it gets brighter. And it's actually about 30% brighter than four and a half billion years ago when it formed. So it's gotten 30% brighter and it's continue, going to continue to get brighter for the next five billion years or so. Now, once it runs out of fuel and it moves off of the main sequence, the core will collapse. And when the core collapses, uh, so it's going to run out of fuel. It'll burn up all that hydrogen and helium in the core. And the core will collapse. When it does this, the exterior layers expand and it becomes a red giant. So this is right before um, it dies, sort of its last death throes, and it gets a little bit cooler, but because it's so large, it's much, much brighter during this last red giant phase. And then once all of that outer layer continues to expand, it will end up as a planetary nebula with a white dwarf at the center. And so um, this white dwarf is like a little um, stellar corpse. There's nothing going on there. It's just the old remnants of the core. And it's very, very hot. At one point, it was tens of millions of degrees, um, even maybe up to 100 million degrees. And so that heat is just left over from when it was um, an active main sequence star. So... That's the lifetime of the star. The big takeaway here is that it gets older, it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And so that's going to affect the habitable zone. If we look at this picture here, this is a diagram of the evolution of the habitable zone. So down here is the age of the sun. This is time going off in that direction. And right here at four and a half billion years is now. Right up here it says present. And here on the y-axis is the distance from the sun. And what you can see here is that the habitable zone gets wider and farther from the sun as the sun gets brighter with age. So it's moving out, it's getting farther away. You can see down here uh, Venus's orbit on this line, and it was really never in the habitable zone. Maybe in the sort of optimistic estimate, um, but not really. You can see Earth right along this line, and it was almost always in the habitable zone, at least up until now. It has been in, entirely inside the conservative estimate for the habitable zone. Now, Mars is kind of an interesting case. We can see Mars's orbit right here. And Mars at the beginning was well outside the habitable zone. But within a billion years or so, Mars should be inside habitable zone. So Mars will, well, Mars won't move. Maybe I should say, let me do this again. It's a little misleading to say that Mars is moving. Habitable zone will expand to include Mars. So if we summarize some of these points, now that we can understand the diagram over here, the sun produces 30% more energy uh, today, and it will continue pr to produce more and more, continue to get brighter, and 
Um, this has left Earth in the what we call the continuously habitable zone. We talked about that. And but at some point, uh, especially with this moist greenhouse effect, we're eventually going to maybe in the next one to two billion years uh, move into a region where we could have some uh, greenhouse effect much stronger, maybe even a possibly runaway greenhouse effect. Now, this is one to two billion years from now. That's a long time. Um, and it may even be farther away than that. There are feedback loops, like uh, the carbon dioxide cycle might delay this for a while. There's a lot of uncertainty there. And eventually, though, as the star goes into, the sun goes into its red giant phase, um, we will eventually look like Venus. We will certainly have a runaway greenhouse effect. We'll get so much radiation from the sun uh, that we will be unable to prevent this. Now, again, this is three to four billion years ago. I mean, sorry, from now. And this is when the sun goes into the red giant phase. And there's nothing we can do about it then. It's actually going to get so large as those outer layers expand um, that it may actually be almost as large as the Earth's orbit. Now, because the gravity of the sun is changing a little bit as it expands, uh, Earth's orbit may actually move outward a bit, um, but it will still be um, well within that uh, inner region of the habitable zone. All right. So the last thing I want to talk about here is the long-term fate of the universe and the Earth. So it turns out that we think we talked about this, that the universe is expanding, and it will continue to expand even well past the longest-lived stars. So the smallest stars, little brown dwarfs, are... Um, they can live for hundreds of billions of years, and the universe will keep expanding beyond that. And not only is it expanding, it's getting faster and faster, this expansion. So it's expanding even more rapidly, and eventually this rapid expansion um, will tear apart all matter um, in the universe. So all matter will get torn apart, uh, we think. We really don't know. We don't know why the universe is expanding ever faster. So at some point, this may slow down. At some point, it may reverse. We don't really know. Regardless, this is many hundreds of billions, if not even trillions, of years from now. So a long time. We don't have to worry about this. And even if this doesn't happen, like I said, there's a lot of uncertainty there. If this is not the case, um, all matter will decay into light eventually. And uh, as the universe expands, it will be redshifted into nothingness. So basically all matter and energy in the universe will decay into long wavelength, low energy radiation. We call this the... Entropy, death of the universe. And so uh, very, very long time scales here. Nothing that we have to worry about. Um, yeah, so that in a nutshell is sort of uh, the habitable zone, the... Uh, evolution of the sun and the long-term outlook for both the habitable zone and for Earth's climate. So uh, next time uh, on Monday, we will talk about uh, global warming in some greater detail. And then um, I'll post a review uh, on Wednesday like I did last time. And then you'll have your exam Friday. So start studying for that exam. Again, it's chapters 7 through 9. And um, 
Have a good weekend. Be safe out there.